All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about how we can use impedance and phasors to solve AC circuits. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you've watched our previous two lecture videos, which introduced AC circuits and phasors. This video continues to build where our previous two lectures left off. So here's our goals for today. First, we will briefly review our math with complex numbers and how to convert AC circuits into frequency domain. Then we'll learn how we can apply phasors, impedance, and Kirchhoff's laws to solve AC circuits. We will see that we can use our favorite DC circuit analysis tools, such as node analysis, superposition, source transformation, and equivalent circuits, in order to further simplify AC circuits. So let's go ahead and start out with a little bit of review from our previous videos. Then we'll do some examples and learn how we can use our favorite DC circuit techniques to help us solve AC circuits. So you'll remember in our previous video, we introduced how to do math with complex numbers. You'll remember in order to add complex numbers or subtract them, we need to convert our complex numbers into rectangular form. So you can either do this by hand or by using some of those online phasor calculators. Once we're in rectangular form, then all we have to do is add or subtract the real parts and the imaginary parts. So you'll remember, in order to multiply or divide complex numbers, we first want to write our complex numbers in polar form. Once our complex numbers are in polar form, all we have to do is either multiply or divide the magnitudes and add or subtract the angles in order to complete that multiplication or division. And finally, to find the complex conjugate, we just flip the sign on either the imaginary portion in rectangular form or the phase angle in polar form. So definitely keep this table handy as you get comfortable completing math with complex numbers. And check out our previous lecture video if you would like further review. Finally, in our previous video, we also introduced this idea of impedance. And we learned that impedance is extremely similar to resistance. We define impedance Z as the ratio of our voltage phasor divided by our current phasor. And so this is very similar to how resistance is voltage over current in DC circuits. So just like resistance, impedance measures the opposition to current flow. Except here, impedance is talking about opposition to current flow in an AC circuit. So the higher our impedance, the less current we get when we apply a given voltage. And so therefore impedance is extremely similar to resistance. And so we'll find out that in today's video, we can treat our impedances very similarly to resistors in DC circuits. And that will allow us to more easily solve our AC circuits. Also, be aware that the reciprocal of impedance is called admittance, often given the letter Y. The units of admittance are Siemens, very similarly to conductance in a DC circuit. Similarly, for impedance, we have Ohm's units. Similarly to how resistance in DC circuits also has 
units of ohms. So in order to solve our AC circuits, it's very important that we know how to calculate impedance. Here is how we can calculate impedance for resistors, capacitors, and inductors in AC circuits. So definitely make sure you keep these equations handy. These are extremely important equations that we are going to be using for the rest of the course. We see that to find impedance of a resistor is very easy. Impedance of a resistor is given by that resistor's resistance. Impedance of a capacitor is given by 1 over j omega c, where here omega is our angular frequency in radians per second. Typically, you take a look at your sinusoidal equations in order to find your omega value. And of course, C is our capacitance in farads. Finally, to find impedance of an inductor, we use J omega L, where L is our inductance in Henry's. So remember, the units of impedance are ohms. So all of these will have ohms units. So make sure when you're calculating that you use C, L, and omega in the correct units. One last thing to remember here is our useful math relation. Remember, typically we do not write our capacitor impedance as 1 over j. Most of the time we take 1 over j and we change it to negative j. This makes it easier to do math with our impedances later on. All right, so finally, last item to review is our approach for solving AC circuits. Given that we now know how to use phasers and impedances, we are now ready to apply these tools to solve AC circuits. Here is the general approach that we will use for solving AC circuit problems in this class. Our first step is to transform everything to the frequency domain. That means we need to write our currents and our voltages as phasers. In order to get everyone in frequency domain, we will also need to find our impedances of each component. So we need to change all our resistors, inductors, and capacitors into impedances. And again, that's using those nice equations that we just covered. Here comes the fun part. Once our circuit is in frequency domain, then we can use our impedances and our favorite DC tools to find the desired values and unknowns in our circuit. So we can treat impedances like resistors and use our favorite DC tools. Finally, once we have found our unknowns, then we can transform everyone back into time domain. Remember, to do that, we can just take our phasor in polar form and convert back to A cosine omega t plus theta. So in the rest of today's video, we're going to do some examples to practice this recipe. And we'll get to see that impedances and phasers greatly simplify AC problems.
and they allow us to use some of our favorite DC circuit tools as if we were solving a DC circuit. Let's go ahead and do a few examples to help us review. First, let's try our review question of the day. In this question, we need to transform our circuit to frequency domain. We are given that our voltage source Vs of t is a sinusoid, and we're also given our inductance, capacitance, and resistance. So let's go ahead and use the equations we learned to transform this circuit into frequency domain. So remember, when we say transform to frequency domain, that means that we need to take our voltages and currents and write them as phasors, and we need to take our inductors, capacitors, and resistors and write as impedances. So let's go ahead and convert using our very important equations. So remember, a sinusoid can be written as a phasor, A angle theta, impedance of a resistor is just its resistance, impedance of an inductor is J omega L, and impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. So these are the equations that we want to remember as we approach this practice question. So let's go ahead and convert. Here we know Vs of t is equal to 48 cosine 500t plus 75 degrees. We want to convert this into a phasor. So notice we have our value A is 48. Our value theta is 75 degrees. So we can directly convert this to a phasor 48 angle 75 degrees. Let's do my favorite one next. My favorite one is the impedance of a resistor. We know from our toolbox equations, impedance of a resistor is just the resistance. That's super easy. So in this case, the impedance of our 80 ohm resistor, that's just going to be 80 ohms. That's our easy one. Next, let's find the impedance of our capacitor. We know impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. What's our omega value here? Remember, omega can be found from our cosine equation. Omega is 500 radians per second. So impedance of our capacitor will be 1 divided by J times 500 times our capacitance in farads. So here we get 25 times 10 to the negative 6 farads. If we go ahead and plug in all that math, we get 80 over J. And remember, since 1 over J is negative J, we get 80 over J. Using 1 over J equals negative J, we determine that our impedance of our capacitor is negative J 80 ohms. So we found our resistor. 
we found our capacitor, we found Vs of t, all that's left is to find the impedance of our inductor. From our toolbox equations, we know ZL is J omega L. So in this case, we just plug in. We have J times our omega, which is 500, times L, which is 0 0.1 Henry's. So impedance of our inductor will be equal to just J50. So here, if we go ahead and draw our final circuit, we have 48 angle 75 degrees volts for our voltage source. We have J50 ohms for our inductor. We have minus J80 ohms for our capacitor. And we have 80 ohms for our resistor. We'll see a little later that I like to use this box trick where I draw each impedance as a box. For me personally, it makes it a little easier for me to combine these impedances if I want to further simplify my circuit. To me, it's a little counterintuitive to be adding resistors, inductors, and capacitors together, but if I have a box, it makes it a little bit easier to simplify. We'll cover more about this box trick in just a moment. So there you have it. We have finished our review question. Let's move on to cover some more examples of how impedance can help us solve AC circuits. So let's remind ourselves of some good news. The good news that we've learned is that we already know the tools we need to solve uglier AC circuits. It turns out for any AC circuit, we can transform that AC circuit into frequency domain, and we can use phasers and impedance and our favorite DC tools to help us solve those circuits. So in today's video, we're going to go ahead and cover the first three tools, and we're going to revisit our favorite DC tools in AC circuits. So today we'll briefly cover how to use equivalent resistors or impedances, voltage current division, Ohm's law, and node and mesh analysis. Later, in future videos, we will revisit source transformation, superposition, Norton and Thevenin, and operational amplifiers. But you'll see that it's actually pretty satisfying because we can revisit our favorite DC circuit tools. And the only difference is that we have to express our circuits in frequency domain using phasers, and we use impedances instead of resistances. And otherwise, the approach to solving AC circuits is extremely similar to the approach we already know for DC circuits. So let's review these first three tools, and we'll spend the rest of this video doing additional examples to help us practice these tools. So let's first start with series and parallel impedances and Ohm's law. We mentioned before that impedance is very similar to resistance. And it turns out that in series and in parallel, impedances behave just like resistors. So if I have a bunch of impedances in series with each other, I can just add them together in order to replace them with a single equivalent impedance. Just note, make sure you follow our complex number addition rules. Similarly, for parallel impedances, we can use our favorite reciprocal formula and our favorite shortcut formula, same as how we used it with parallel resistors. 
So if I have two impedances in parallel, I can write an equivalent impedance, Z equivalent, where Z equivalent is equal to Z1, Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. And again, here, you need to make sure you use complex number math rules. And remember, online phasor converters can be really helpful if you need to convert back and forth between rectangular and polar forms. And finally, Ohm's law also works for impedances. Remember, in DC circuits, we had V equals IR, but in AC circuits, we have V equals IZ. So we can use Ohm's law to help us solve for unknown voltages and currents if we know our impedance. Just remember, everything here is in terms of phasors. So another really nice thing is that Current and voltage division also work with phasors. And so the same rules that we know from DC circuits also work with AC circuits. So for example, we can use voltage division. So if we have N impedances in series with a single voltage source, we can find the voltage across the nth impedance using voltage division. Just remember here that we do have phasors, and also remember that it's still important to pay attention to polarity. Also with current division, same rule applies. If we have N impedances in parallel with a current source, we can find the current across the nth impedance using the current division equation. Notice the only difference, the only difference is that voltage and current are phasors, and we use impedance Z instead of resistance R. Otherwise, these tools are just like what we used in DC circuits. Impedance allows us to combine resistors, inductors, and capacitors together into equivalent impedances. But sometimes it's a little bit counterintuitive to be adding a resistor, inductor, and capacitor together. So one trick that I find helpful is what I call the box trick. This is completely optional, and so you do not have to do this, but I recommend it. What I recommend you do is after you convert to frequency domain, replace all the inductors, capacitors, and resistors with a rectangular box. So notice here, I can redraw this circuit with each resistor, inductor, and capacitor drawn as rectangular boxes with the given impedance value in ohms. Then you can treat these rectangular boxes like resistors and perform your DC circuit analysis as usual. So again, this is not an official trick, like box trick is not an official name. This is just something I made up. But for me personally, it makes it a lot easier to combine impedances and apply DC circuit tools if I have boxes instead of inductors and capacitors. So try using the box trick 
and see if you like it. See if it helps you more easily visualize and solve AC circuits. All right, so let's revisit example one. You'll see that we looked at this circuit briefly in our previous video. In this example, we have an RLC circuit. Notice there's an inductor, resistor, and capacitor, and we have a sinusoidal source. So we could solve a second order differential equation for this circuit. Or we could use phasers. And our new AC tools. So, of course, if you wanted to, you could apply our techniques from our second order circuit videos. Remember that 10 step recipe? That would be a valid approach, but that's a lot of work. So, here, Let's go ahead and use phasers and our new AC circuit tools. And you'll see that we'll be able to solve this circuit and determine I of T very quickly without needing to solve any differential equation. So let's go ahead and give this question a try. First, we need to convert to frequency domain and find our impedances. And then we want to find current I of T. Notice here, since we want I of T, that means the final answer should be written as a sinusoid. So let's go ahead and give this question a try. Let's follow our new recipe, where first we convert everyone to frequency domain, we find our impedances, then we use our impedances and our favorite DC tools to solve for our unknowns. So first we need to find our impedances. So remember, we need to use our very important equations. So here, we know the impedance of a resistor is equal to its resistance. Impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c. And impedance of an inductor is j omega l. So here, if we want to find our impedances, we just use those equations. So the impedance of our 30 ohm resistor is just 30 ohms. How about our capacitor? What would be our omega value for this question? Notice the omega value can be taken directly from our sinusoidal input. So here, impedance of our capacitor is just 1 over j times 1000 times C, which is 40 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. So if I go ahead and simplify that, we'll see that we'll get 25 over J 
which simplifies to negative j25 ohms. Lastly, we have ZL. That's the impedance of our inductor. Impedance of our inductor is just J times omega times L, which is equal to J times 1000 times 0 0.065 Henry's. Notice, remember to convert your units. We want to make sure everybody's in farads and Henry's here. So 1,000 times 0 0.065, that gives us our inductor impedance is J65 ohms. And finally, our voltage source Vs of T, well, we're already in cosine form. So Vs of T, our voltage source, we can just take our phase angle and our amplitude, and Vs becomes 12 angle 15 degrees. So in frequency domain, we end up with the following. So here I went ahead and applied my box trick. I'm rewriting my inductor, resistor, and capacitor as boxes, where each box has the impedance that we calculated. So we have a J65 box for our inductor, 30 ohm box for our resistor, and a minus J25 ohm box for our capacitor. And this is the result for the first part of the question. We have converted this circuit successfully into frequency domain. The next step is to find find our current I, which here is our current phasor. Let's go ahead and redraw this circuit one more time. So remember, our goal in the next part of this question is to find I of T, but first we need to find our current phasor I. So remember, now that we are in frequency domain, We can treat our impedances like resistors. So in this case, I want to find my current I, and I have a voltage source with 12 angle 15 degrees volts. So if I wanted to find current I, and if I had three resistors in series, what could I do to simplify this circuit? So if you're thinking we should combine the impedances into an equivalent impedance, you would be correct. So let's combine the three series impedances into an equivalent impedance. And then we can apply Ohm's law. So 
So if we do that, Notice we get our voltage source, and now our equivalent impedance is the equivalent. That's just going to equal the sum of my three impedances. So if I add those together, I'm going to get 30 plus J40 ohms. And remember, by Ohm's law, my current I must equal my voltage V divided by impedance Z. So therefore, I can write my current baser I must be 12 angle 15 volts divided by 30 plus J40 ohms. Well, wait a minute. I need to convert this to polar form. So if I do that, I get 12 angle 15 degrees divided by 50 angle 53.13 ohms. And if I solve that, notice now I can just divide, and I will get 0 0.24 angle negative 38.13 degrees. Are we finished yet? Yeah, we're not quite done, right? Because notice now we need to convert. We need to convert to a sinusoid. We want our final answer as a function of time. Well, how would I convert 0 0.24 angle negative 38.13 back to a sinusoid? Yeah, all we have to do is remember that A angle theta can be rewritten as a cosine omega t plus theta. Here, we know omega is a thousand radians per second. So therefore, our current I of t simply becomes 0 0.24 cosine 1000t minus 38.13 degrees, and units are amperes. So notice, we just solved a second-order circuit without having to do a second-order differential equation. Because we had a sinusoidal input and constant frequency omega, we were able to convert this circuit into phasers and impedances and solve using our new AC circuit tools. So phasers and impedances can be an incredibly powerful tool here. Let's go ahead and try another example. This example might be very similar to a question in the homework assignment. So definitely make sure you take a good look at this example. So in this circuit, we are given that we have a voltage source with 18 cosine 800T as its sinusoidal voltage. And we want to represent this circuit in frequency domain and then simplify the circuit into a loop containing two impedances in series. So notice this first impedance here should be our impedance 
from the 125 millihenry inductor. And the other impedance should be all of the circuit components on the right-hand side of our voltage source, Vs. So in this case, we need to first convert everyone to frequency domain, and then we can apply our impedance tools to combine and simplify the impedances. So let's first go ahead and convert to phasers and impedances. And so in this case, if we use the equations that we know, we can convert Vs of t into a phasor Vs. And in this case, we have our phasor 18 cosine 800 t plus 0 degrees, right? We don't have a phase angle in this case. So here our phasor Vs, that's just going to be equal to 18 angle 0 degrees volts. And next we can go ahead and convert our impedances. And let's remind ourselves once again. Let's remind ourselves of our favorite very important equations. All right, so if we go ahead and do that, let's go ahead and find the impedance of each component. Let's just work our way from left to right. So first, the impedance of our 125 millihenry inductor, that's going to be J omega L. What's our omega here? Notice our omega is 800. So for our inductor, we get J times 800 times 0 0.125 henrys, which gives us J100 ohms. Next, we have our 120 ohm resistor. What's the impedance of a 120 ohm resistor? Well, that's just our resistance, or 120 ohms. Remember, that's our favorite equation. Next, we have our 140 millihenry inductor, which we can again use J omega L. So we have 800 for our omega, but notice our L is now 140 millihenries. So that will give us J112 ohms. Next, we have our 5 microfarad capacitor. Remember, that's 1 over J omega C which is 1 over j times 800 times 5 times 10 to the negative 6 farads. So if we multiply that through, that gives us 250 over j, or negative j 250 ohms. And finally, our 80 ohm resistor, that's just going to equal our resistance. 
So we get 80 ohms. So now we have successfully converted our voltage source and our various components into phasors and impedances. Let's go ahead and redraw this circuit and apply our box trick. So now, now that we have our phasors, let's draw our resulting circuit and apply the box trick. So in this case, I'm going to take my existing circuit with the resistors, inductors, capacitors, and I'm just going to replace the resistors, inductors, and capacitors with boxes. Remember, this is an optional trick but it can make it easier to combine and simplify the impedances later. So I'm going to take my circuit and I'm going to apply the box trick and here's what I get. So I have my J100 ohm inductor on the left. I have my 18 angle zero voltage source. Then I have my 120 ohm resistor. And then on the right hand portion of my circuit, I have my J112 ohm inductor. I have my minus J250 ohm capacitor, and I have my 80 ohm resistor. So now that I have this circuit and frequency domain, we can now treat the impedances like resistors. And in this case, we can simplify using our favorite DC circuits tools. So in this case, notice our goal is we want to combine, want to combine the components on the right-hand portion of our circuit into a single impedance. So how would we do this if these were resistors? Well, if these were resistors, the easiest way to combine these would be to recognize that we essentially have We have our 120 ohm impedance in parallel with our J112, our minus J250, and our 80 ohm impedance. So notice we can combine our three impedances in series. And so if we do this, remember, just like resistors, all we need to do is add them. And we can make an equivalent resistor. Where here, our equivalent resistance is J112 plus 
negative j250 plus 80. That will give us our equivalent single impedance will be 80 minus j138 ohms. And then we have 120 ohms in parallel with that. So now we have two parallel impedances. So if these were two parallel resistors, we could use our favorite resistor equations. Here we can use the same equation for parallel impedances. So let's go ahead and combine those two parallel impedances. So remember, so far we have the following. So far we have our J100 ohm on the left. We have our 120 ohm resistor in the middle. And we have just simplified this rightmost resistor to be 80 minus J138 ohms. So we want to combine these two impedances using Z equivalent is equal to Z1, Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. So in this case, we have a 120 ohm impedance in parallel with 80 minus J138 ohms. That means our Z equivalent is going to be equal to 120 ohms, which is the same as 120 angle zero degrees, times 80 minus J138 divided by 120 ohms plus 80 minus J138. Remember, we need to follow our complex number math rules if we want to simplify this thing. So notice, if we go ahead and combine, in the numerator we have 80 minus J138 times 120 angle zero, and in the denominator we have 200 minus J138. So here we need to convert to polar form so that we can more easily combine those two together. Remember the 120 ohms, that is a completely real number, so that's just equal to 120 angle zero degrees. You can see that also if you were to put it in a phasor calculator. It's the same as putting in a a plus J0, because there's no imaginary part. So if we convert everybody to polar, we end up with 120 angle zero degrees. 80 minus J138 becomes 159.1 angle negative 59.9 degrees. And our denominator becomes 242.99 angle negative 34.6.
So now all that's left is to multiply and then divide. And if we do this, we determine our z equivalent will be 78.77 angle 25.3 degrees. So if we know the z equivalent, by replacing the two parallel impedances, we are now left with our circuit in the desired form. So there you have it. And then notice, we can find V using voltage division, but be careful of polarity. Notice if our current is flowing in the counterclockwise direction, voltage division will give us the opposite polarity that we want. So we'll need to multiply by negative one in order to flip the sign and get the polarity that we do want. All right, so that concludes this example. So in our homework assignment, you might see that we have a similar problem where our ultimate goal is to find this voltage V. And so it's very important to notice that if you're doing voltage division, notice that we can write the voltage across Z equivalent. That will be calculated as our impedance Z equivalent divided by the sum of the series impedances times V source. But remember, you're going to need to multiply by negative one due to the polarity difference. Because notice, if I apply voltage division, I'm going to find my voltage in this polarity. But notice we want the opposite polarity. So watch out for sign errors when calculating this voltage V using voltage division. Also notice another important convention. By convention, when we write our phasors in the form A angle theta, we keep amplitude as a positive number. So if you do this voltage division and you end up with a negative amplitude, make sure you convert your amplitude and your phasor such that your amplitude remains positive. So notice to multiply by negative one, we basically just add 180 degrees to our phase angle because what that will do is that will basically rotate us 180 degrees in the complex plane. So please keep these hints in mind as you finish up the homework assignment. All right, let's now finish up with our last example. So in this example, we have an AC circuit, and you'll notice that we've already converted this one to frequency domain. In our review question, we already performed the conversion to make this circuit in frequency domain. But now we want to see 
how we can use node analysis to write a node equation for node 1. And believe it or not, we can actually use node analysis in order to solve for that node voltage phasor, V. So let's go ahead and try applying phasors, impedances, and our knowledge of node analysis in order to write a node equation for this AC circuit. So notice we already have the circuit in frequency domain. So this is already converted, and we've already applied the box trick. So in this case, we have already converted to frequency domain. And we've applied the box trick. So now we need to write a node equation at node 1. Let's remind ourselves about the steps of node analysis. Remember, we need to first identify our nodes. We need to choose a reference node. We need to apply Kirchhoff's current law to the other nodes, not the reference node. And then we rewrite our Kirchhoff's current law equation in terms of our node voltages and resistances, or in this case, it will be in, in terms of node voltages and impedances. So in this case, our node voltages are phasors. So let's go ahead and revisit these steps. Notice we have a node over here. We have a node at the bottom of our circuit. And we have our node 1 that we want to find. So in this case, it's convenient to make our bottom node the reference node. And if we do this, then notice the node here on the upper left, since we know we have voltage phasor Vs, this node is sitting at Vs volts. And the only unknown node in this particular circuit is node 1. And notice node 1's voltage will be equal to that voltage V across our capacitor or our resistor impedance. So in this case, we've identified our nodes. We've chosen our reference node. Our next step is to apply Kirchhoff's current law. So let's apply Kirchhoff's current law to node 1. We've already been given that we have current I entering. Notice it's current phasor. We have current phasor IC that is leaving node 1. And we're also given that we can assume we have a current phasor IR also leaving node 1. 
So by Kirchhoff's current law and bank account convention, we can say plus I minus IC minus IR must be zero. So we've completed step three. Our last step that we need to do for this question is to write our node equation. And to do that, we need to rewrite our current phasers I, IC, and IR in terms of our node voltages. and our impedances. Let's go ahead and give this a try. And remember, even though we have impedances and phasers, the approach is still the same as what we did with DC circuits. Just instead of resistance, we now have impedance. Instead of current and voltage, we have current phasers and voltage phasers. Otherwise, the approach is the same. So, so far, remember we have the following. We have plus I minus IC minus IR is zero. And we want to rewrite I, IC, and IR in terms of my node voltages. That's Vs and V. And my impedances. So what would my current I be? Well, notice I'm starting at voltage Vs. I'm ending at voltage V. And my current I passes through a 50 ohm or a J50 ohm impedance. So by Ohm's law, I can say that my current I is equal to Vs minus V divided by J50. This is just like if we had node analysis with a resistor. This is the same approach that we used for node analysis back in the beginning of the course. We can use the same approach to find IC and IR. Notice, if I wanted to find IC, Notice I'm sitting at voltage V, and IC is passing through a negative J80 ohm impedance. So I can say that IC must equal V minus zero divided by negative J80. Or IC is equal to V over negative J80. And finally, we need to find I. Using a similar approach, we can show that if we're passing through our 80 ohm impedance down to our ground, we're starting at voltage V, IR must equal V minus zero over 80 ohms. or just V over 80. 
So therefore, we can go ahead and substitute. So if we substitute our values of I, IC, and IR into Kirchhoff's current law, we get our node equation. And our node equation becomes, remember Vs here is 48 angle 75 degrees. So we can substitute Vs in as well. And we end up with the following. We have plus I, so I is equal to 48 angle 75 minus B over J50. So therefore, we get 48 angle 75 degrees minus B over J50. Then we have minus IC. IC is minus, in this case, we have V over negative J80. So be careful here, we've got a minus negative. That will become a positive. And then finally, we have minus IR. IR is V over 80. There is our node equation. And notice, we can actually solve this node equation as well. Just for fun, let's go ahead and show how we can solve this node equation. So we can solve the node equation and determine V. So we have the following. We have 48 angle 75 degrees minus V divided by our value J50. Then we have minus negative V over J80, so I'm going to rewrite that as positive V over J80. And then we have minus V over 80 equals 0. So in this case, we have a lot of fractions going on. So we can go ahead and let's just multiply both sides by J400. And if we do that, you'll see that things are going to simplify a little bit. That J50 term will vanish and we will have 8 times 48 angle 75 degrees minus V. The J80 is going to vanish, and we're going to be left with 5 times our voltage V. And then if we multiply 80 by J400, then we are going to be left with minus 5j times v. So at least we got rid of our fractions. You notice now in order to do complex number math, we need to rewrite some things in polar and rectangular form. So I'm going to rewrite the numbers in polar form. So in this case, the rectangular number 8 becomes 8 angle 0 degrees, 5 becomes 5 angle 0 degrees. Finally, we know 5j can be rewritten as 5 angle 90 degrees. Because if we're completely imaginary, then we live only on the 
complex or vertical axis of the complex plane. So if we do that, we can just simplify a bit more and we get eight angles zero degrees times 48 angles 75 degrees minus V plus five angles zero degrees times V minus five angle 90 degrees times V equals zero. Notice here we can combine the V terms and simplify. So I'm going to distribute my eight angle zero into the multiplication. So I have eight angle zero times 48 angle 75 minus eight angle zero V plus five angle zero V minus five angle 90 V equals zero. So if I simplify a bit more, I see I can multiply the first two terms together. I will get 384 angle 75 degrees equals, we can simplify, I can combine my V's, move them to the right hand side, keep 384 angle 75, product of these on the left, and I get the following. This I can convert to rectangular, and I will get 3 plus J5. I can convert this to polar so that I can perform division, and I will get 384 angle 75 degrees is equal to 5.83 angle 59.03 times voltage V. And therefore, I can determine that my voltage V is equal to 65.86 angle 15.97 degrees volts, or in sinusoidal form, and there you have it. So notice using these node equations and our phasors and impedances makes solving these problems a lot easier. So let's go ahead and wrap up here for today. You should now be more familiar with using our AC circuit tools to convert between time domain and frequency domain and to use phasors, impedances, and our tools to solve AC circuits. So please keep all these equations handy and definitely practice the examples we've covered until you get comfortable using phasors and impedances. Thanks everyone for joining the fun and we'll see you in the next video.